for love once again. I'm a big big girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello and welcome to Big Week. Big Week is a series that examines the life of lawyers who are not into litigation. Lawyers that have made a name for themselves in the niche area of the law that they have excelled in. It's about knowing the law and applying it to the best benefit that can inure to your client. That's the only test. All right, on this episode of your favorite legal show, Big Week, we have a special guest in the house who's a man of many parts. Now, he's a lawyer, he's a farmer, he's a diplomat who was an ambassador from Nigeria to Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay. Also, founding partner of Ajumogopia and OKK. Ladies and gentlemen, Please a warm welcome for Ambassador Chris Nonyalu Okeke. So thank you very much, sir, uh, for having us. I, I, won't, I don't know if I should do the Nigerian introduction where we call um, His Excellency Ambassador Barista. <laughs> I think, Agriculturist. I think Chris good Okeke. morning, sir. It's a, it's a decent enough. Do you find opening. those things offensive? The titling? I don't know about I don't know about offensive. Or unnecessary. I think unnecessary is a better word. I, I, I mean, I think there's a distinction between excellency and ambassador. And excellency is on the job when you're representing the only excellency in the country, yeah. the president. Once you move out of that space, you're stuck with the name ambassador because that's who you become. Yeah. But you're not, strictly speaking, His excellency. excellency anymore. Yes. But because of the way we, <laughs> the aberrations in everything we do, you're still called Excellency 10 yeah. years after you leave your job. Yeah. Let's go back to the beginning of all of sure. this, you know, growing up and your environment and all of that. Before the law thing happened, what was it like for you growing up? It was great fun. I, um, Were you born? In Sapele in okay. what is today Delta State. Came back to live in Lagos at age five and stayed, went to school, Our Lady of Apostles Private School and then St. Gregory's College. Okay. And then the Federal School of Science. And then away for a while, for a long while. And when I came back, I had four degrees, one in economics, business administration, law, and a further degree in law. So what did your parents do? Well, <coughs> was there a law lineage already? Or? It's not correct to say that I grew up wanting to be a lawyer. When I was growing up, I think you were more likely influenced by your parents directly than anybody else. Yes. So I knew many uncles who were lawyers and whatever, but I couldn't say I knew what they were doing. I mean, just he's a lawyer, so. Um, no. no but my mother, for instance, would have been very happy if I ended up being a doctor or an engineer. Hearing that you know, law was your third degree mm -hmm. makes me wonder if it was an afterthought. I want to ask, as much as you said there were not a lot of people around you who mm -hmm. studied law, especially close family, was there anyone who at the time growing up sort of piqued your interest and you wondered, oh, this wouldn't be bad? Any no. sort of person you'd looked up to at all in some way? No, and I, I, I hear you and I, I know that the temptation is to have locked in your mind with Somebody. this one guy <laughs> who just made everything. Listen, I've had a very growing up, right? I, I, I was enrolled as an articled clerk to become an accountant in England. I joined the Institute of Chartered Surveyors and I was a, an intern at Knight Frank and Rutley in Hanover Square in London. All these were towards attempting to find who I was, where I wanted to be. I always, in the back of my mind, wanted to, dreamt of being a lawyer, a particular kind of lawyer, which is why I read economics and business. And then- So while you were doing those, you knew you were going to do law? At, by the point at which I was doing that, I knew I was going to do that. Before I went back to do A-levels in literature, history and um, 
government in England. I know you said there was no person per se who was sort of a model, but was there a moment that happened that made you realize, okay, yeah, I think the law is... Because you said even while doing economics and all of that, you knew you were going to end up doing law. Was yes, there a moment? I had this fascination about law and business. So, I mean, there's many things that you try. As I said to you, I tried to become a chartered accountant. I tried to become a chartered surveyor because those were options available and you looked at everything. If I said that at 18, 19, 20, I knew what I wanted to be, it's, it's a myth. I mean, yeah. I wanted to be many things. Um, but you end up, as you mature, with a choice and a track. Yeah. What was the law school experience when you came back? Because you now studied abroad in different schools, yeah. had the experience of sort of what education is outside of here. Because mm -hmm. even for people who study here, I always say the law school experience is always different, good or bad, for whatever reason. What was it like for you? <laughs> well, I think, first of all, I'd come from a system that has a bar exam at the end of your university education. In the three months directly after your degree, you prepped for bar exams in your state, Louisiana, New you York, just go whatever. Exam, and the day after that, you were rolling. I came back to the discover that you had to go back to school effectively. And I'm not sure if it could not do with a revision. Yeah. It isn't to get another academic laurel. It's to get a practicing certificate. Yes. So the person that you engage with on the other side wants to feel that he can be safe in your hands. Now, if you've never heard of civil procedure and evidence and criminal procedure, but you're a star, you got an A in insurance law and shipping law, I, I'm wondering if the guy can trust his business with you. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you're done with law school. Yes. Here. Was, was the dream, okay, like you said, of course, you said business was always going to be. Yes, but Business you know, and law was what the attraction was. So you were never going to do litigation. You always knew that. I, I knew you were going there, but that's a fallacy. Because anybody who comes here to do law is clear on the first day that it's a fused profession. Yeah. So the question of I was never going to do didn't arise. Your certificate, your permit from the Supreme Court says a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Your responsibility is to be those things to whoever is asking. If before you have entered one person's office, you know you don't want to do litigation, that's based on myth. It's not based on personal experience. You don't know your skill sets. You don't know what's required of you. How do you know? And, and by the way, just because you don't do litigation doesn't mean you can be a successful um, office lawyer. It's not like this or that. So you go in and you do everything that you're allowed to do and then gravitate, for whatever reason, towards your choice. Or your strengths. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's not, I knew what I wanted because, as I said, my education in the U.S. meant that I was exposed to that environment and the way that law worked with business. So I dreamt of that. But it doesn't mean that litigation was excluded because I, I did litigate in this country until okay. 1996. So oh, it's, not, really? it's not correct for anybody to assume I came back, I just went straight into, because you can't. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are with audited accounts and cash flows and income statements. If you don't know the process that you have to go through in court in this country, you can't advise that your big corporate client. As an extension of this conversation, <laughs> yes. is, the, is it a myth or is it a fact of sort of the opinion of Litig litigation versus soliciting versus the academics, yes. you know, as lawyers. We hear that conversation come up a lot, yes. especially with the senior advocates of Nigeria mm -hmm. awards or, you know, when they are conferred with that. You know, it's almost like there's ranks to what a great lawyer should be. Litigation, well, the academics sometimes even get considered more than the solicitors, it feels like. Well, Do you think that's a myth or it's a thing? Well, let's put it this way. Again, you cannot 
divorce yourself from the environment in which you live. It has become de rigueur to be rewarded with this huge stamp of yeah. seniority or excellence. The truth is, if you're like me and you're a capitalist, true and true, then fair competition is a requirement for everything that I do. Unfair competition is making you SAN and not AJ. Because he assumes that you are better than AJ. But in my time, in my life, proving that that's not necessarily the case was one of the motivating factors for everything that I did. Because it's about knowing the law and applying it to the best benefit that can inure to your client. That's the only test. Now, that you've done 60 cases in the Supreme Court and 50, yeah, I'm, and I don't take away anything from it. I think when we all signed up for enrollment, you must have known that SAN was part of the game. So it wasn't something they snuck yeah, behind all you, all, all, all of right, sudden. all of a sudden. So, do I have a problem with it? No. We inherited many things and assumed that you took it lock, stock and barrel, whether it applied or didn't. Yeah. Okay? You know, you talk about barristers and solicitors and you can just be this or just be that. Nobody ever tells you why you have a fused profession here. That would be interesting for you to discover because the people who set it up for you came from a divided profession. So why did they make it fused for you? In any event, in the 50s and 60s, there was only so much work your uncle or my grandfather could get as a lawyer. Okay? Yeah. So you left it open. Because if you said, I want to be a solicitor in 1955, was USC going to give you their work? No, because remember, English, Scottish, and Irish lawyers were practicing in Nigeria then. By definition, they were going to get the job before you. Okay? So, think, when all these noises made about a fused profession, it was for a reason. It was so that you had a chance to get work. Otherwise, you'd have been stuck yeah. looking for work. So, just final thoughts on the SAN thing yes. before I go back yes. to... What does the senior advocates of Nigeria requirement look like in your space? Because it looks like requirements now are really tied to, like you said, 60 cases in the Supreme Court. Yes. If you're in the academics, you've written the tons of books yeah. or whatever. But for the soliciting space, it almost looks like there's really nothing. What does it look like in that space? Yeah, but at why the ideal situation? The only recognition that you need, I think, is a client who will say, talk to Ebuka. You got this problem? Yeah. That's, that's what matters problem. to you. That's all that can matter. I'll tell you some another secret, and my partners and people who know me will tell you. We did not when we first came into this space, you had retainers. Lawyers were retained by all the big boys, UTC, yeah. UAC, and so on. Leventis, etc. We didn't. On the basis that if we served you well, you would come back. And that's the only retainer that we had for years when we started. So it was a gamble, obviously, mm -hmm. as a marketing tool, but it worked. Because nobody actually wants to pay you money to keep in your pocket for him, and you're not a bank. He pays you in January your annual retainer. He has no problem till July, by which time you've squandered his money. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and you're not really keen to do anything for him. So what does he do then? Okay, sure. so yeah, Makes it's, sense. and it's not about any one item, it's a philosophical thing, it's how your mind works. If it's business, then you know you owe it to Ibuka to serve him to his satisfaction. Yeah, fair enough. How did you and Odea Jumagovia meet? Where did this meeting happen, and how did this firm Interesting. come about? <laughs> Interesting, I'd come back, finished law school. I was exempt from youth court okay. because I 
My first degree was before the cutoff date on the 31st of May, oh. 1975. And um, worked with first Professor Yu Yu Uche and Associates in Western House, and then with Tomisi Thomas and Co, still in Western House. Odeya Jungobia worked with Fred Egbe and Co in Western House. And so in the corridors and the yeah. lift and stuff, we saw, I didn't know him from Adam. He didn't know who I was. I saw him in court. I saw him robed. I saw him. And I thought, nice kind of guy. And basically, I'd been talking to people round about then about the possibility of establishing a law firm. Okay. Um, I was never interested in a one-man practice. Okay. So the natural instinct was to look for a partner. It took him a while to buy in completely. <laughs> but in the meantime, a young lady who lived with him, his sister, who is now ambassador in, in Greece, instantaneously bought into it. And so, till today, she refers to me as partner, and I refer <laughs> to her as partner, because we were partners before, before Ordain actually agreed to come, come on board, form this firm together. So that's how that happened. It was pure happenstance. It just, you see somebody that strikes you as, and because I hadn't been here for a while, I'd only been back two, three years, and to say that I knew anybody other than people I grew up with who clearly were not in the law space or yeah. doing anything would be nonsense. So that's, that's interesting because, you know, with partnerships, like you said, it's very tricky. We have the trust deficit in Nigeria. We don't need to go into it. Well, what, it, what was it about him? What's, because you, I'm getting that you were not even friends. Maybe no. you became friends. Yeah, we did. And, and but see, what was it about him that made you just believe that it would work? Again, when you do stuff, it's, it's great with hindsight to analyze what you did. Yeah. At the time, it was very simply this. He dressed in a certain way, carried himself in a certain way, made no noise, wore Oxfords and brogues and dark suits and white shirts and plain ties. And, and if that was what, in my mind, was the image of the ideal, then this was the guy. Yeah. And that's all it was. As you say, we then, because during the intervening months between striking up the conversation and, I mean, we'd met socially and said hello yeah. and this and met at one party or the other, but no, there was no intimacy, nothing. But during the negotiating stage, you became a little more intense, got to know each other a little more, which is why it took him as long as it did. I believe that his sister's reaction was based on female intuition rather than anything else that, you know, he's probably not going to cheat you. Yeah. And that was enough for her. Um, but yes, with time, we became ever more closer um, to the point where today I consider him, in spite of 50, 40 years of going back and forth and different um, views, misalignments and stuff, as one of my closest people yeah. um, today. What was, what, was, what was the philosophy, what was the plan to be, for the firm? To be the biggest, the finest, and the best law firm in Nigeria. That was it, simple. Yeah. Sounds like rhetorical nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> but we were young and you're entitled to dream. Yeah. Was that possible? I think we assumed it was, if your mind was, conscience was clear, it's easy. Then we came up against the reality of the marketplace. But it didn't stop you trying to be best. And best meaning, <coughs> so some people write letters in English, which could very well be Greek or Arabic, because you can't make head or tail of it. We made it a point to be clear. Yeah. And that's the, the best part of it. Yeah. And you know, so use every means that you had to be better than the next. You've talked a lot about how, you know, coming back to Nigeria, um, you had to adapt to the reality 
of the situation here. But you've also talked a lot about how business influenced, you know, whatever you studied with business law and the intention you had. So what, what was the goal when the firm started? Or what defined, you know, Ajumogobi and Okeke? Was it the reality of Nigeria or was it the passion you had for business law? What exactly defined it? Well, well I think... You know, you can have passion about many things. Yeah. But if there's no application possible, it's a waste of time. When I said we were motivated, I was driven by business and law and the alignment of the two. Businesses require help with litigation issues and general advisory work. So it's not the case that you chose to represent UAC because you only want to do solicitor. You can't, you can't represent them fully. And so when I said you want to be the biggest, the finest, and the best law firm in the country, it's a philosophy that is difficult to describe but resonates in the mind of the person who buys in to understand that it means even your engagement letter is of a certain type. Yeah. So what, 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 what's sort of defined your practice area um, with the firm? Did you ever have the luxury of choosing what you wanted or what sort of portfolios you were going to work with? And what kept you interested for over two decades in doing that? Well, I think you, you go into business, there's a market. Yeah. You do a study, whether formal or informal, and you decide we were going to represent corporate Nigeria. Okay? That was the plan, the that grand the plan. plan. Yes. And that meant whatever they needed, you would provide. So litigation, this, I happen to have had a leaning towards advisory work with some litigation as well until 1996, as I said. And Odey had done significant work in litigation and was naturally interested in developing those skill sets further. Okay, so something evolved in-house where work gravitated in two basic directions because there was a goalkeeper at each end of the post. And that's how it became that full service firm that did everything required to do in law in Nigeria. Yeah. Were there moments when you wondered, what the hell am I doing? No, because I was young <laughs> enough, naive enough, to believe that adrenaline is all you need to keep going. And you were doing okay. In the sense of, I mean, I think people, a lot of people, know, whether they admit it to you or not, seem to think that it is more lucrative, it is more rewarding, it, is, it pays more for you to be a commercial lawyer in the sense of a solicitor. That's a myth. But that's where all the money is, isn't it? No, it isn't. Have you done election tribunal? Election tribunal. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, because true, that's where true. you live. It's not, it's not true. the theory of London yeah. and New York. It's here. And that's our reality. And that is your reality. So that you choose to do that is because that election tribunal thing has no appeal for at you. all. Yeah. At what point did you realize? So, two part question. You have started this firm in '83. You guys were, you know. At what point did you realize? Okay, we are actually the firm. Was there a moment? Was there a deal closed? Was there a client booked? Um, and second part. Um, what were the highlights, for want of a better word, through the years there, where you figured, you okay, this was the point where I got to point A, this was the point where I got to point B. Were there moments Again. in progression? Because you said of air a lot of, and it's true, I know I've met a lot of our big time lawyers now who have a history from Ajumo Kobe and Okeke. So, so you had a lot of shining stars okay. now as well. And I'll say yeah. this, as I said before, it's, it's easy on reflection to signpost things. We started early and we were fortunate early. One of the most celebrated 
And most of the things we did at Ajogobi and Keke, which are not announced or publicized. Re- yeah, okay. Um, Nigeria was in a state where, with the military government, extemporaneous statements by the executive were deemed to be law. Okay? Now, how do you tell a military general who is in charge of your country with his cohorts and the Supreme Military Council that actually that thing is very nice and important but it does not condescend to law? So, you see where the excitement comes from is the how dare you? But we dared. Chairman of a company, board meeting, storms out of the meeting with his friends on the board. The meeting continues. And they remove him as chairman, appoint an interim chairman, and continue the meeting. He comes back to Nigeria, a meeting is held outside, as they did then, um, and says that the military government said that you cannot do this and you cannot do that if you are working in Nigeria. Okay. So I said, with respect, company law does not know chairman. It knows director. director. The law of meetings knows chairman. And chairman is to help manage meetings. So it isn't a life appointment and it does not signify ownership. It does nothing other than empower you to coordinate affairs sensibly on the day. Now, this person was my partner's uncle and had worked with my father. So if you were a true-born Nigerian child, surely you didn't go against your uncle (laughs) so-and-so in public. But we did. And seven months later, the court decided that actually there's a point. You have a point. The meeting was quarried when it started. It continued to be so, even after you stormed out. Okay? But I've said it in two lines. It took seven months to make it clear because he then muddied it up. This is the first Solicitor General of the Federation, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, biggest commercial lawyer in Nigeria, blah, 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 blah. And how dare you pull stunts like that? Anyway, fast forward several years later, because he remained uncle Ibuka, he had lunch with Odey and I, and he said that he very much enjoyed lunch, and he wanted to leave us with something. And he said that I would have done exactly what you did all these years ago. So congratulations. So, you know, that's like, you stop for awards and things. That's the kind of stuff. That's what I meant by it is that endorsement that is your reward. It's more gratifying. Yes. Yeah. So it wasn't because I didn't like him, he was a horrible uncle. It was a, it's just, it's about law. And so that defined the practice. So all the white boys who were leaving, who were having problems here with their Nigerian partners for whatever reason, understood that regardless of who the Nigerian was, these mechanics only do engines. They don't do emotion, don't do uncle, don't do... (laughs) And so without ourselves marketing as such, that became as far as people were concerned. And that was, if you were to be honest, that was where the bread and butter and the real coins were in practice, in commercial practice. It's those companies that were here, whether they were 100% Nigerian, 
whether they were foreign, partially foreign owned or, or, or yeah. Around what year was this? 84, 85, 86. It oh. started soon. Not too long started, after. Not too long, which is why it was able to stamp us early. Yeah. And then you started flying. And then there were other things. There was the first cross-border um, transaction on the New York Stock Exchange with a Nigerian company, etc., which we did with and um, Credit Suisse was Boston at the time. Yeah, so and there's many, and there are many small events that meant yeah. that, um, it, it kept us pumped up, is what it was. Okay, so I hear, I hear you know, all of this, um, and it's very impressive. You know, a lot of us know the history of the firm and all of that. Do you think those things are still possible today? Um, a lot of lo young lawyers look at all of these firms and the names, and we see what, how young you guys were when you started these firms. You know, sometimes late twenties, early thirties, at most mid thirties. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty young. Um, today, it's d different times. A lot of young lawyers, you know, complain about remuneration, at law firms, and all of that. I always wonder if they could start their own thing. Um, how easy is, is it today? How different do you think it would be Well, if you graduated today? You can say that times are different, but when we started, times were different. Nigeria had gone through indigenization in 72 and later on in um, 78 or whatever, right? There had been a boom, there was a bust. At the point where we came in, Nigeria was not booming. This was, it coincided with a time when people were leaving because of the uncertainty in the foreign exchange regulations in Nigeria. Companies were, um, how do you say, working here for five years, had not been able to remit um, dividends or royalties or fees. So, so sounds like 2022. Yeah, yeah. So, so exactly my point. So that it's not the day in the cycle. The cycle is a continuum, right? So today is a set of realities. They're different, but they're exactly the same as I had to contend with in 1983. In 1983, the law, as you know it, was dominated by big big guys. So big that they were singular big guys. I mean, their firms or appendages were nothing other than appendages, right? So it wasn't just coming in with new ideas. It was fighting that establishment, however quietly. So if you come up against Chief Rotten Williams as a new wig, I mean, if you don't shit yourself, um, there's other things that happen to you because you're in the presence of the legal, end. Legal royalty. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yes, times are tough, but that's what they say when the going gets tough, tough get going. So, I have no apologies to make. The young man who thinks that it is my sworn duty to give him enough money to do everything he wants to do, has got it mistaken. All of us must have started at the... I told you, I came back to earn 6,000 naira, 500 naira a month, as an associate with UUJ and Associates, okay? There's no way... I mean, I was paying rent of more than that. But that's because I'd brought a car with me and sold it at the first opportunity and was flush with cash. And I bought an eight-year-old uh, Toyota Land Cruiser from my father's farm. And that's what I drove as a law school student and beginning lawyer, okay? Yeah. yeah. So it was never the case that you were satisfied. And I guess if you balance the lack of pecuniary satisfaction to what you're learning and the variety of opportunities that are presented to you, then I suspect that you make the balance and agree that 
No one person can give you that. You, you, you talk a lot like you enjoyed practicing. Absolutely. And you were in it for 2009, I want to believe, was when you retired from... When, yes, the first from... official attempt at leaving the law. Yeah. <laughs> first official attempt. What informed that? Did you well, stop enjoying it? Did you stop giving Let's put it this way. When I joined Hands With Ordain, there's this unspoken thing, which was mentioned once or twice, but never written down anywhere, that I would not leave the firm unless my father died and I had to go and re arrange and manage his affairs. Okay? My father died in 1997. And I thought, that's why I said the first official attempt, because yeah. it occurred to me that, but it just wasn't right at the time. And I thought, yeah, we'll see. So you try and marry both responsibilities. By 2009, I realized that you couldn't. And so I begged off to go and tidy the estate, the business that my father left behind. And so that's, that's it continued and culminated in what you saw in Quara when you hosted yeah. the opening of the rice mill. Yeah, the rice mill. So you, you would have stayed longer? If you didn't yes, have to go and, to and there's no... Would you still be doing it? There's no gain saying that I will still go back if they will have me. Really? Yes, absolutely. It's it. Honestly, it's the only thing that I ever felt a deep enough passion for. Yeah. I do agriculture, I love it. Um, in spite of the obvious non-existence of the ecosystem to support it. So I have failed spectacularly in agriculture, but I, I stay in it because I can't give it up after 50 years. I still believe that one day we'll make a success of it, so I, I continue. But Lord comes to me sufficiently naturally that if I had an opportunity tomorrow, I would go back. What does an opportunity now look like? Again, it requires definition. Um, the firm is larger than I could imagine myself a part of today. I can't do anything about that, yeah. obviously. Um, hence the um, slow and steady approach. Yeah, it's a, it's a doing thing. Yeah, because again, you have to come to the definition of the space. All those opportunities that I told you exist. There's AI, for example. I'm 70 years old. I'm not clear just how quickly and how well I can Grasp learn that. Others. But to drive the process doesn't require me to be an expert in AI. So that would be an area that I could look at. Because, you know, we used to do agreements, local and international agreements. And it struck us very early on that a 700-page document from White and Case or whoever was revised every 16 hours and uh, you know so whilst you're reading page 274 a new version comes and you have to finish 700 before you start this one then you start looking for with ai you cut across that nonsense very quickly and and so there's that so it's the new way of doing the same things that not that you're doing anything new but the new way of doing what you used to do before so yeah. Um, but you're right, I mean, if you've gotten out of all of this that I genuinely am passionate and love law and the practice of it as a business, then yes, that's correct. So would you say you've, you had a successful career, what does that success mean? And like looking back, did you, would you say your time as a lawyer turned out the way you would have wanted it to? Well, again, you see, the, the thing about trick questions is they look like simple things, but they're so, they're so they're pregnant. Slight, they're slightly layered. Yeah, yeah, they're so pregnant with the wishes of the question. Yeah. You ask me if I feel that I succeeded. I'm Sorry. going to digress for a second and say, I told you that I failed, I have failed spectacularly in agriculture. I can say that. Yeah. because I know I have. In spite of that failure, I believe that the 1,000 mistakes I've made, which I will never make again, 
are my unique selling proposition. So I have no regrets about saying that I have failed spectacularly. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I have absolutely no hesitation in saying of myself that I made a success of the law. Um, now, um, what does that mean to me? I don't know. It gives me huge satisfaction because I, I know today what I didn't know in 1982, 83. Yeah. The impediments, the odds, the difficulties that need to be climbed before that your glib, the biggest, the finest, the best, you know, <laughs> don't Did you achieve anything. all that, you think? Then, pardon? Do you think you achieved all that? The biggest, the finest, the best? Well, no firm. <laughs> at the point where I left, I could have said that. Yeah. There are not the huge firms that you have now at the time. So you achieved it at the time? I believe so. I, I, and I think to whatever extent you did was sufficient given the environment that you were in. It's not the definition. We didn't define biggest. We didn't define <laughs> best. We didn't define finest. But as long as you came into the environment and you felt like, oh, wow, okay, nice. That's achieved it in where I feel. If the bank balances reflect a certain ability to manage costs over time, you've succeeded. So yeah, I, I have absolutely no hesitation yeah. in considering my adventure as having been successful. Yeah. We're going to pivot to your other life outside of the law, but before that, do you still do any kind of legal work now? No, what you mean like moonlighting and stuff, and <laughs> pretending that I'm a lawyer. No, I told you, I told you, I believed in partnership and the firm structure. If I can't work in that, then I'm trying to do what I opposed when I first came back, which is the one man band that. Yeah. It has I mean, no, it could be consulting on the side. It doesn't hold any real appeal for you. No. So you've said a few times here that you know the law is a business, and. A lot of people may not necessarily understand what that means, but there's also a school of thought that the system almost inhibits you from actually treating it as a business. And I'm saying this as a layman. You visit places like America. I think one of the first things that hits you when you get out of the airport is a billboard of a lawyer advertising something or an immigration law or something. There's, there it's really commercial. We are almost the opposites. Even putting a signage at your door is almost sometimes frowned upon. What's, these are two extremes. Is there a middle ground where people start understanding why the well, law is really a business? Well, again, both examples you've used do not in any way detract from the concept of law as a business. Now, let me try and explain what I mean by a business. If Basser was running a hamburger shop, yeah. he would have to pay rent, pay NEPA, pay water, pay telephone, pay his workers. If Chris Okeke opens a law firm, he has to pay NEPA, water, rent, salaries. So how is it different from his hamburger business? Yeah. That's the law is a business. So you have to and have should that not be, You know, the, the, the reason for that distinction is that before, law was this very exclusive mythically spiritual area of endeavor in life where only angels and saints um, and you know you didn't discuss money my point exactly no because the white man who formed that idea was a member of an exclusive club that had all the guys powers that be as members and so when he says Basso, you do remember my young son, Ebuka? He says, yes, I remember him very well. He says, he's now qualified as a solicitor. Okay. That's all the advertising Ebuka needs. It's finished. It's not business as if to say I'm USC or this and, and therefore you say it's difficult to advertise. You find means of advertising, as I said, I am fortunate that Basil introduced me to Philip Morris. I did one case and they were exceedingly happy with my output and results. That's like that uncle of Ibuka's at that private club in London where yeah. all you have to do is say, boom, 
and they just the OKK, who has no uncle at that club, has now to use wants his work. to do law. He believes he's very much brighter than that Ebuka boy, but don't know how to reach the market. So he thinks that advertising is the answer. No. Yeah. At the point where they started allowing advertising in America, you had reduced law to the simplest elements of the law. So there's no magic in immigration law. What is it? You feel from 621, A45, and G47. So you think that's too extreme as well? It is. And that's what I'm saying. You don't, don't compare situations because the law has evolved to the point where that's possible in America. In Nigeria, because you followed the British who like to pretend that the same rule applied to all of us in this room, but you know <laughs> it's not true. Because Bastien's father is Lord something. Your own father is Sir somebody. My own is working at London Transport. <laughs> and hopefully we're going to be the same. No, unless I break lucky. And that's just life. It's nothing to do with Basil or with Ebuka. They didn't right. wish me yeah. bad. It's just that's where cookie crumbles, simple. Okay. And when you think that there's a way, if you advertise to my client, Philip Morris, who I served for 20 something years, 30 years, and acted as chairman for 15, 16 years, that that's from advertising, then you've got it wrong. It's like people say, how do you market? When I told you about drinking till 2 a.m., nobody thought it was marketing, but that's, yeah. that's all it that's was. That's basically what you were doing. You're showing the guy your capacity. Yeah. On the one hand, he likes to drink, you like to drink. Okay, so we can There's some signage friends, here already. Whether you get work or not. Then he tries you with work on a day after a heavy night and at 7.30 you're behind your desk. He says, not bad, he's the correct guy. Okay, and, and that's marketing. It's not advertising only that is marketing. So it's basically the same thing you've been saying about understanding your reality the of where you thing. are and everything. It doesn't change. Okay, so you left, you left the line in 2009, went into agribusiness. I went back into Back agri into agribusiness. Yes. Did you... Because this is you live in a world you're sure of, a world you're excelling at, you're mm -hmm. successful at, and so, for want of a better word, the unknown. Um, and you've talked, unknown. you've talked a lot about a lot of the reasons why it's not working, and you almost use the word failure. It wasn't unknown. So what were you going into? Why did you decide to make that switch? I told you my father had died. Yeah. I needed to make a determination whether he had wasted his life and my inheritance, okay? And so I went half around the world. I went to Thailand, I went to Brazil, I went to Cuba, I went to Colombia. These are all countries that grow cassava commercially. To attempt to understand what commercial cassava was, because there was a reason why it wasn't working and it still doesn't work here. Yeah. It was easy to say that it was because this thing or this thing or this thing, but actually it was that ecosystem that didn't exist that was the huge impediment. It isn't any one thing. So yes, there's not sufficient lending going into it. There's not sufficient understanding from government. The, the well, financial policies in Nigeria don't necessarily encourage, etc., etc. So basically, it was to help me determine whether to take off from where my father had left off or just collapse the whole thing and face my law. And my so business. you didn't go into it scared? No, I don't go into anything scared. But you've talked a few times here about, you know, you failed. I said I failed spectacularly based on my own measure of success compared to what I did in law. Okay. In spite of the difficulties that we encountered in law, both structurally and interpersonally, I believe, as we said at the end, that I made a success of it. I haven't been able to say the same for agriculture, is why I say I have failed spectacularly, because the third party who's judging doesn't make allowances for all the impediments and the yeah, lack of a just one system. It just knows, if you have all these years, you have nothing to show for it. 
That's are, you, are you still doing it now yes. to prove something to yourself? Is it for your father? No. What, what, no. Why are you still it sticking to it? It may have been it? the motivation, but it is that I believe very firmly that unless you can feed yourself, there's very little else that you can do constructively. Yeah. So yourself here is Nigeria. If, if you've never seen food riots, then you don't know what they can be. And if you don't know what they can be, you can afford to be negligent about food. So it's bigger than all of that It now. is. Absolutely. Very quickly, what, do you, what are you farming? Cassava, because that's how I entered agriculture with yeah. my father for the starch factory. But as you know, I opened the rice mill in Quara in 2013. Yeah. So we are trialing rice. Um, there's also current activities in Ekiti where we're preparing land to do serious trials for cassava, which we will do, and corn and soya. Oh, yes. Very important staples. Absolutely. So how did ambassadorship happen? Because um, you served Brazil, Bolivia, Bolivia Paraguay, Paraguay um, for three to four years? I three say. years. Three years. Just a few weeks shy of three years. Was this something you... How did that happen? It seems like another just... <laughs> TV no, issue. it didn't. You know, you ask a question, was it something you planned? I don't think you can plan something that depends on Basel to make appointments. Yeah. I think you can aspire, you can hope, you can wish, you can dream. And as a young person, I don't know if you know, I'm honorary legal advisor to Her Majesty's government in Nigeria and I've been since 1989. Okay. So there was some diplomacy already in there? Yeah, and the firm did a lot of work that could qualify as diplomatic related work. Um, and as a kid, as a younger person, it was not unusual to hear me say, I would like to be the Nigeria's High Commissioner to the Court of St. James. Okay. But, and that's where it was left. It was, I made no effort to be anybody's High Commissioner or Ambassador. Okay. At the point where this offer was made, um, you may or may not be aware, I was in court with federal government agencies and a company in Nigeria, right? So, strictly speaking, nobody would have made that offer. Somebody somewhere, and I'm sure that if we dug deeply enough and had more time, we could come to where it could have emanated from. But it's fair to say that it just came. It's hard to believe because I'm not APC, I'm not PDP, so um, that would be a requirement normally, but yeah, um, it's, it happened. I welcomed it, I embraced it with both arms, I enjoyed it. So you, it was an enjoyable experience? Absolutely. Um, it, in terms of the diplomatic work, it was not different from what we'd done for 30 odd years in Nigeria. Did your legal background prepare you for, for diplomacy? Well, in any way. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's useful to define areas. Diplomacy is an art form. Your life experiences are what bring you to being able to perform within that space. Um, a lot of people believe that if you don't work for a foreign ministry or you don't go to diplomatic academy, you can't be an ambassador. But I mean, what is an ambassador at the end of the day? And that's the definition. It's a person who you can send off to represent you somewhere. And because of the way it is structured and missions are structured, you have a defense advisor. So nobody expects me to be 100% on top of um, defense issues, the difference between an Exocet missile and a this missile. So you have a defense advisor, and then you have an economic advisor. And yours is like the barrister who brings together the work of the evidence clerk and the civil procedure and criminal procedure and the 
this and this, and then he presents it to the Supreme Court or whichever court. Mm. So yes, it, it wasn't, I found it particularly interesting. It was not um, difficult at all to blend with it. Yeah. Um, there's a certain socialization which is a part of successful legal practice which manifests in many things that you yeah. do. So the ability to hold your own in conferences and receptions and dinners and, and things like that. So you'd say you were successful at that as, I, a, as an ambassador? I believe so. I had two foreign ministerial visits from Brazil to Nigeria and one from Nigeria to Brazil. And I was in the middle of bringing back the vice president of Brazil to Nigeria when the president of Brazil returning from a trip from Florida to see Trump, his key aide was diagnosed with COVID. And so not sure whether he was infected or not. And if he was, the vice president could not be out of the country at the time. So on the Friday before the Sunday he was supposed to arrive in Nigeria, the, the visit was called off. So yes, in terms of diplomatic relations with my country, I believe that I had a good outing. Yeah. You speak how many languages, sir? Because <laughs> I want to know if, if... Did you learn the languages when you got there with like Brazil, Paraguay, and Bolivia, or did you speak any of those languages then? Well, Paraguay and Bolivia speak Spanish. Spanish. Brazil speaks Portuguese. Portuguese. I was based in Brazil. That was the main assignment. I covered Paraguay and Bolivia. Bolivia. Now, because of travel and other restrictions, the bulk of my time was spent in Brazil. And yes, I speak Portuguese now as a consequence of being there. But yeah, so it's not a need to learn a language. No, it isn't, <laughs> if you're interested. Fair enough. But you... it's fair to say that I did not learn Portuguese and become as proficient as to be able to do the diplomatic work in Portuguese yeah. now. Because that would have been irresponsible. But I can hold my own in conversational Portuguese at uh, most yeah. levels now. Good stuff. So ambassador, agribusiness, lawyer, but you're also on the board of a lot of companies. I used to be. Oh, you used to be. Um, what prepares a lawyer for being in the boardroom? It, nothing prepares you for anything. It's like people who say, I've been in House of Rep, Senate, Governor, so I can be president. No, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It isn't the law that they bring you to the board for because they have legal advisor external. They have uh, in-house uh, legal advisor. So they're not looking for your law. Yeah. They're looking for a perspective which has evolved over time based on your interaction with society, commerce, etc. So that the way you look at things today is different from that cold-eyed technician who is law, black and white, no gray, no nothing. <laughs> you are able to look at a set of accounts of a company as much as you hate mathematics, you've trained yourself to read balance sheets um, spreadsheets, everything, and you contribute based on your knowledge. So if they do oil and gas, you're not expected to be a geophysicist as well as an <laughs> oil expert or anything. It's just bring something to the board, That's correct way of doing stuff. Yeah. When you look back in your career from Western House yes. to 2009, your legal career, anything you would do differently? No, again, week. again um, if you believe, you believe, okay? There's no, you don't believe today and not believe tomorrow. Today, I have the benefit of 40 years of mistakes. Would I repeat them if I did it again? Clearly not, unless I was an idiot. So yes, to that extent, as the word you used was tweak, yes. I would make fewer assumptions. I would be like Ronald Reagan. I believe, but I verify. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I mean, before I told you describing a day, he wore dark suits, white shirt, yeah. tie, 
and you just went to the thing. And yeah, it struck. It could have gone wrong. It struck a chord, or it could have. Yes. It struck a chord, and you built on that chord. Today, you would do a little more than just a background the chord. check. Yeah. You guys are still very good friends? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kelly said so much. I think I know where you stand on this, but just for anybody who happens to see just this clip, yes. I'm about to ask now as a piece of advice to young lawyers or new weeks. Um, because there really is a perception out there that there is pressure to do litigation, to be a successful lawyer, or to get to the pinnacle, which is the titles we've talked about. What do you tell a young lawyer today who believes, I really don't want to do litigation? I, first of all, to give anybody advice, I mean, you don't just walk off the street and tell him what to do or not to do. Why? doesn't he want to do litigation? I need to understand that. Before you advise? Yes, because as I said, in my view, it is in his interest to do litigation. Whether to stay in it or continue is then a judgment that he makes after the fact, not before. Because you cannot be a good commercial lawyer if you can't tell the man what his chances are if, if he goes he to court this, tomorrow. Yeah. You just want to do the beautiful stuff in the office and you are finished. The, the man is still in trouble. Okay. Okay. So my advice is don't be too quick to determine what you want to be. The reason people don't do it is not because it's tedious. Nothing in life is easy, especially not here. So it is by definition difficult. I concede that. But that's not the reason not to do it, especially if it can round you completely and make you whole and a better commercial lawyer, if that's your dream. All right, away from all of this, just, I mean, I've been watching you since you've been here. Not that I'm a professional and I can diagnose anything, but you seem mentally healthy, you seem fit. Do you consciously keep that as a part of your routine? Is it exercise? Is it dieting? What, well, I how do you stay sound? <laughs> I think that, first of all, I don't do fashionable things. So I walk, I swim. Still actively? Yeah. I'm, yes, I'm like, uh, yeah, I, I swam this morning. But I don't, I don't swim every day, I don't walk every day, I don't lift weights every day because I don't need to. I feel healthy, as you say. I stay out of trouble. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I believe the rest is also as God created me. I used to be like this. I was actually called Stegomaya in St. Gregory's College. <laughs> uh, and, and so when people see me today, they say, I mean, you put on weight. And I say, my friend, I'm 40 odd years married. If I still look like a rake, <laughs> wouldn't, you, wouldn't you have problems? <laughs> what do you think the woman is doing all these years? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. As long as I don't get outside of a certain band, I'm yeah. fine. I was, I was going to ask, do you think you would still be this sort of mentally sound and you know all of that if you were still practicing? But then you are in the agri space, which is the queer stuff. So, <laughs> I think, I think the question of soundness of mind yeah. is you can't legislate it. I mean, you know, so at one point you were 60, 55 and you retired in Nigerian civil service, then 60, then 65, then 70. Then. I think the important thing is. If you're still corpus mentis, it's not fair to force you to do anything. Yeah. Like retire. If you're still productive, why? Yes. And if and and everybody around can testify that you're still there. Not the <laughs> level. No, obviously. You can be that at fifty if you get a stroke and so on. So but there's some seventy five year olds who are cracking hot. That's wrong. Thank you very much, sir. I don't thank think you, you have any closing words, but... Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I, um, all I can say is good luck to everybody who wants <laughs> to do law. None of it is easy. They just take Nigeria as they find it, and they try and crack it the best they can. All right, guys, there you have it. A true journey of a legend. He's taking us through his life, through the legal space, through farming, and of course, the diplomatic world. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've been inspired by this amazing guest we've had. Please join us next time on Big Week. My name is Ebuka Obi Uchendo. Well, once again, I'm a big big girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to run things up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're making great moves, big moves. Yeah, yeah.